said, uh, yeah, I thought it over and I'd like to talk to the committee. And, and I know every man that was on that committee, there's two of them from the Legion and then there's two of them from the Lions Club that was on that committee. So uh, I said, the only way I'll make that uh, jump, you can advertise a blue and essential parachute jump, but don't give me my name, don't put my name on it. I don't want my name put on it because they didn't want the folks to worry. They didn't even know I had an airplane for several months. They <laughs> 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 on me. I never told them. And so, okay, they would do that. So uh, they advertised this, and uh, they, they, they were going to get a bunch of people at this picnic grounds, and that was uh, just north of Sherpless on Huff Street, just north of where Paulson and Sherpless had their lumber company. That was all open at that time. There's a creek flowing through the west end of it, and the ball diamond in the front is, is all open territory. <clears throat> And they had this picnic, and they had a ball game going on that day. But you know, it's a job to, to really put one of these things aloft. It isn't as easy as it is today. But then, shortly before that, then the committee got a hold of me again. They said, say, uh, we would like to have you buy this blue and parachute. What do I want with a blue and a parachute? Well, they thought it would be a good idea so they would be responsible in case that thing wouldn't open up and they the <laughs> other way to So I said, my God, so what is that going to cost? Well, they had all figured out. $175. <laughs> <laughs> they had all figured out ahead of time. <laughs> okay, there's nothing I can do. They were already advertising the jump and a parachute and a balloon ascension. And uh, so I finally went through with it. And I, they said, well, I said, here, I'm just out of money. I got an airplane and I got a balloon and a parachute. Well, he said, we'll give you a, another jump. We'll have a picnic on Labor Day. Well, before Labor Day came around, I didn't hear anything about it. So well, I'll tell you what happened on this jump then. We had to dig a trench 18 foot long, about a foot and a half deep, and we covered it with corrugated metal and dirt on the top, and we had a, a fire pit on one end, and on this other end we just had two by four uh, framework like where we put the canopy of the room over the opening. So we built a good fire of wood on that end in the fire pit, and of course it'd travel along the flue and get up in this here uh, room. And as the room kept filling up, filling up, and got higher and higher, when I got the full size and wasn't quite tight enough, then they doused kerosene in that fire pit and the flames would go up there awful high enough. And we had one fellow, we had asked for a volunteer to go in the inside with a broom and several buckets of water because he had to keep wiping the sparks off the... <laughs> but he was sweeping all his sparks off. So we had a whole bunch of people holding it down. Now this thing is getting real tight and it wants to really get away. So here, it was a McGuire Balloon Hauling Company from Chicago that built this and they came out to help us fill up the balloon because we didn't know anything about filling up a balloon. So they helped us fill and told us just what to do. So instead of having a harness for me, I'm only sitting on a strap underneath that balloon. No, no harness whatsoever, just a strap underneath my butt like in a swing. <laughs> and gee, I said, my God, I never been up in anything like that before, no harness. Well, he said, they, they're thinking of my welfare. And, uh, so they got a half inch rope and tied it around my belly <laughs> and I a shroud cord so in case I'd fall off this here, that I wouldn't fall to the ground. <laughs> 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 They, they were taking care of my welfare. <laughs> and, uh, so after, and my dad and mother and my sisters were there at the picnic and watching all this thing, and they didn't know I was going to make the show. <laughs> so, when, I, when I got in the, this here shrug cords way on the end and got in this strap, and my sister uh, hollers at me, no, no, Bill. 
But that thing, he said, let go. <laughs> and that's so full of hot air, it don't go up easy. So you can't, you can't carry heat with you. So you have to fill it up high enough. As it cools off, it'll still take you several thousand feet high so you can make the jump. It just about tears you to pieces when you leave the ground. <laughs> and uh, it was just a matter of seconds, I was up there 2,000 feet. <laughs> it felt like it was tearing me to pieces. I, I was swinging like this. <laughs> I was spinning around. <laughs> spinning around and going up. And, yeah, I know what 2,000 feet was. I thought, well, I'll maybe jump at 2,000 feet because I had uh, flown and I knew what 2,000 feet was. And then I thought, gee, I'm just going to look above me once. And holy God, I was all pushed up. I didn't realize the balloon wasn't spinning on me. I mean, <laughs> this whole thing was all pushed up. And so then I couldn't get released from up there. So I had to cut myself, kicking around, 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 till I lined up straight with, with uh, shroud cord and everything above me. And by that time, the balloon just kept gaining, 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 you know, they do it all the time. And I'm looking up, get this all uh, straightened out. And I look down, I can't even find it. You can't hit the ground anymore, you so high. And what they seen, there was a North Mountain Railroad track and the E.J. and E. Railroad track, and we're right in that corner of the two railroad tracks, see? So I, I could follow the two railroad tracks and oh my God, there they are. Oh, my God. Oh, I was sitting there, but that's when I had came across the feet. And then, then I uh, pulled my ripcord up there to, to release me from the balloon. And then, oh, I dropped uh, quite a ways before that thing opened up, but I had a lot of altitude, so it was all right. And uh, so then as I was drifting down, and the balloon has a iron ball on top of it, so when your body weighs the left, the, the underneath the broom, the broom will tip over me, but all the heat and smoke out, and that'll come down something. <laughs> so, uh, when my parachute was open, I was drifting down. Then I got worried. I couldn't see the broom passing me. I said, gee, that thing directly above my parachute going to bounce down on my parachute. And I couldn't see it. And, and of course, the canopy of the, of the parachute, I couldn't look past it. So finally, I was getting down near South Hager Avenue. And I thought, boy, I, I don't want to land in the street or in the trees or in the houses. And I remember there was a woman just hanging up clothes. Hanging <laughs> up clothes, and here I was right above her coming down. <laughs> and I guess it surprised her. <laughs> but then I, I pulled my ripcord and I slid over just enough to get over into the cornfield, that was Hart's cornfield, and that's right up to high school, just about where Abraham Lincoln's bust is on the high school, if you ever see that on the lawn, that's where I came down that cornfield, so I landed on nice soft ground, and my balloon came down, oh, north of the railroad track, about a mile away, uh, it was on the east side of Hart Road, north of the railroad track, right down the whole big group of oak trees. And believe it or not, it came down like an open space. <laughs> well, I had, in the meantime, I had gone over to the Palatine. That was a Cook County uh, race uh, ground and also the county fairground. I thought, maybe they'll spend some money. Maybe I can make Bruin Ascensions over there. So I, I went over there to see if I could get some Bruin Ascensions. Well, the manager, he didn't want to spend money on that, so here I am. The fall started coming on, and I had uh, the balloon, the parachute, up above the LTI office. That's for the what? That is a back, back candy company. What's the name of that candy brand. company on the end of Lake Street? Brand. 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 Yeah, uh, right where that candy Oops. company is. Uh, uh, I had a building just in front of it. Uh, that's where Rice's plumbing is. I had it up there. So one winter day, I walked up there to see how my balloon is. It's all in a great big funnel there and the parachute. And I got all, there are some mouse traces in there. So, oh boy. Mice in my parachute and balloon. <laughs> and, uh, so I thought it's time for me to get rid of that. I had an airplane anyway to 
mess with. So you can dig in ditches up. <laughs> I'm afraid it might catch on fire before you got up in the air. So uh, then I took it to uh, Thompson Brothers Blue and Honey Company at Aurora, and I sold it then. Sold it for a loss, but I, I made some money off of it. So that was the end of my book. Well, then, uh, a little bit about barnstorming. I, I only have 10 minutes left, so I'll, I'll try to squeeze that in. Uh, so uh, I, after I had my transport license, of course, I had been uh, instructing in Elgin, instructing students. And I had to give them all acrobatic flying, because those days you wouldn't get a private license unless you uh, tailspin would come out tailspin. So I used to give them all acrobatic flying. And we never ever carried a parachute. That's as dumb as we were in those days. But uh, every student got tailspins, loops, barrel rolls, vertical banks, and, and, and all that. Now today, I don't think you have to tailspin for a license. Oh, those days they never give you a license. And, and when you went for a transport license, you had to land in a space of 200 feet. They'd say, now here's a river. You have to get over that river and land before 200 feet away without the use of your motor. So uh, the inspector would probably say, well, go up there uh, 1,200 feet, make a 720 degree turn without the use of motor and land right here. And he's standing in front of you watching you. And of course, you had to make your tail spins too, and all that, and uh, yeah. vertical banks. So, three times out of three times, you had to make that uh, without the use of your motor, and you didn't dare side slip. That's something. You ever get instruction side slipping? Well, you you can side slip a plane, tractor you right over top of a field, and then straighten up and land right in that field. So we had to give side slipping to all the students and the group. But you didn't dare do that here. You had to make your judgment that good on there to land three times out of three. Otherwise, you'd be wiped out without a license. You were stripped. Then you had 10 questions on motors, 10 on transportation, 10 on uh, meteorology, and uh, 10 on rigging. And you didn't dare miss one question. First time I took a test, I missed out on uh, uh, air pressure at sea level. I was off a pound. <laughs> and so they wiped me out on that. Yet I had passed my flying test and everything on the thing. So then you had to take everything over again maybe several months later, which I did. Well, after I had my uh, swallow, hmm, here, the one uh, in Wichita, Kansas, then I do some barnstorming. So uh, I'd head out on a nice Sunday or a holiday or something and head out someplace in Illinois or southern Wisconsin or wherever it would be and see a nice town below. And I thought, gee, here's a good town to probably land if I can find a field <coughs> close by to carry pastures. And usually you'd always look for a good field right near the town and a good main road. There's no, no cement roads that time, but a good gravel road. So, you never made any agreement with any farmer land in the field, so you never knew how we would take it if you, you would land in the field. So what I would do, when I figured that's a field I'm going to land in, when I was flying over, I'd switch my motor on and off. The motor would bang and bang and spot and spatter, and I'd circle around and keep banging and banging, and finally I'd land in it. And that right after I land, out would come the farmer in a Model T, or he'd come running up in the field, and by that time, I'm out of the cockpit and I'm underneath the motor of the plane with a wrench, you know, and taking the well nuts off the carburetors. And, and then he'd say, gee, he said, I heard your motor is missing. I said, yeah, it was missing, but I didn't tell him I made it miss. <laughs> <laughs> At that time, oh, a bunch of people, they heard that motor miss too. See, and they never saw an airplane down on the ground before. So a bunch of people would come over to take a look at this airplane. And then I'd say to the farmer, gee, it's a beautiful day and quite a few people around here and it'd be a nice day to carry pasture. Now I'll give you a ride and your wife a ride and the kids will hire men a free ride if you allow me to use your field. And everyone would agree. But their wife would ride with me and the hired man or kids would ride with me, but never a farmer. <laughs> With that contraption spitting and sputtering up there, he wasn't going to take that chance to ride with me and that happening to him. 
So uh, they were very good. And I, I'd be busy carrying Packers from the time I'd land until it would be time to head back home before it got dark. Never stopped except long enough to shut off the motor, put gasoline in it. They would even invite me over for a dinner in the evening at the house, but I would never go in the house because I didn't have time to pay pastors all the time. <laughs> so they'd bring sandwiches or coffee out to me and I'd eat that in the time between the pastors getting out of the cockpit and other getting back in. I'd eat and drink the coffee at that time. And so just before ready for us to go back home, you were the fellow that was selling tickets for me and here I have the type of tickets that we would be selling. Uh, then I'd make an announcement to the crowd that this ticket seller here will crawl, uh, crawl out on the wing of the plane and jump off in a parachute if he can get enough coins and a half. Can we borrow a hat from him? anybody? See, you'd have hats coming from all over. <laughs> so you'd pass a hat around, and people put nickels, dimes, quarters, or whatever they did in, the, in this parachute jumper, he'd get all that change in. So uh, then uh, I'd take him up, and at that time, they had the silk shoots at that time. See, we didn't have to tie it to the strut. <laughs> so uh, I'd take him up there a couple thousand feet, and then they'd crawl out on a wing and, and then jump off the wing. And uh, I'd kick the tail out of the way so they wouldn't hit their head on the stabilizer. <laughs> and uh, then after I saw the canopy open, the parachute would open. Then I'd do a little stunt flying on the way down while he's drifting down. And then I'd land there and pick him up and then we'd head back home. So it'd really be a, a, a big day for them. And they, uh, farmers all enjoyed it. So uh, <laughs> that was the uh, end of our barnstorm. See, there's something I was going to... Did you ever make any money barnstorm? Yes. Yes, I could make money. And then uh, when it got to be depression times, when everybody was short of money, I still do some barnstorm, but I'd take a scale along with me and only charge a cent a pound for any passenger that wanted to ride with me. But anybody that weighed uh, less than 100 pounds, the minimum uh, price was a dollar, so I'd charge a dollar for anybody that was uh, weighing less than 100 pounds. Is there any questions on something? Yeah, was gasoline about 12 cents a gallon? No, we uh, used high test gas. I, I think it ran maybe around 22 cents a gallon on the high test at that time. Or you could use common gas too. Oh, I. Would you, would you tell about when the Hindenburg came to Barrington? When the dirigible came to Barrington? When, when the Hindenburg? Oh, oh, uh, uh, that was the Hindenburg, yeah. Grab, grab, Oh, I almost, almost tripped off that antenna on that thing. <laughs> 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 so and uh, I, I, I knew it was all right to meet it. We had a radio on at that time, and I, and I heard the last report I had over there, Davenport, Iowa, and then I was heading for Chicago, so I figured uh, about the word would be coming over around Aurora over that uh, area. So then I told the students, I was instructing students at the time, I said, I'm going to quit instructing right now, but two of your students can ride with me. I'm going to see this here graph separate. So I took off, and I met up then west of Aurora. And uh, and it was flying kind of slow, and I never could fly that slow with the airplane next to it because I'd be losing altitude. So I flew alongside of it and I changed uh, headway on the, to the front and then circled around the tail again and come in that way. That's why I followed it all the way to Chicago. And all the, the highways below, everybody's car was stopped and you were all outside watching this uh, plane that uh, Zeppelin go over. And, uh, I followed it all the way into Chicago, and by the time I was getting around in Chicago, it started to get pretty thick with airplanes. Where I was out there, I was alone first with it. We were getting pretty thick with airplanes, and gee, you'd have, have an airplane right above your head, and you look above your cockpit, and you see a landing gear of a plane right above your head. <laughs> <laughs> I taking pictures. Now, why? I didn't have a camera, and I knew that thing was going to come through. 
I didn't have a camera, and neither one of my students had a camera, and I could see these Germans in there. The, the, the windows were open, and they were leaning the way out. I could see, we were supposed to stay 300 feet away from them, but we, we broke the law. We were a little closer.